Hey guys, welcome to the Pulse Radiology Anatomy series. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. If you've been here before, welcome back. We love having you here. Hey guys, so today we're going to be discussing MRI of the brain. Again, from a tech perspective, so to the left we have how to, pay, how to set up the patient. To the right we have a generalized protocol. Like I always say, no imaging center is created equally, so these sequences can be off or be used uh, but this is again something pretty routine that every site should be using so to the left we have mri setup uh, usually the patient likely 98 percent of the time is going to be uh, supine head first okay uh, you're going to be using an eight channel coil likely with this type of exam there's going to be a high rate of claustrophobia so you want to use certain means such as earplugs uh, to reduce the noise you know, maybe some, uh, you know, blindfolds, reflection glasses, increased communication between each sequence. So things like that, keep that in mind, okay? Body position is gonna be mid sagittal line perpendicular to the alignment light. The landmark is the nasion, okay? And on the coil, there are some markers. So just kinda, at the end of the day, you're gonna get that head inside the coil comfortably. You know, make sure the nose is straight. You don't want it tilted to the left or tilted to the right, cause then you gotta, you know, angle your slices inside the scanner. So try and get it as center as possible. Support, I always say, put something right under the legs. That tends to be a nice little, um, you know, comfort on the back. Hearing protection is likely always going to be earplugs, but you know, as things move on and, and technology advances, you might be able to get some some uh, some music playing in there. To the right, we have MRI protocol. So another routine, you know protocol here sagittal t1 is likely what's going to start this off right after your um you know your, your three plane localizer so sagittal t1 uh, what it does is it visualizes or produ you know produces a visualization of sagittal midline structures so it gives you a good um you know diagnostic view from a sagittal point of view right center, dead center of that mid sagittal line and then you sort of base off all of your axial cross-sectional slices off of that so Another reason why I have it listed like this, again, every site is different, but let's just say because we said high claustrophobia rate, there's a chance that you won't get through this case, right? So you always want to start off with a DWI first, you know, and your flares. You want to get those out of the way that they're, they're, well, DWI is the shortest, but, you know, the flare tends to be a little bit longer. So that being a very important case when you're ruling out stroke get those in, get those out. I'm talking specifically at those ER imaging centers, people coming in with strokes, you wanna get those done first, just in case this, the, the patient bails. So DWI checks for restricted diffusion. Okay, so on a stroke, you'll see um, markings of that, which is present through a bright signal intensity within the first, first 48 hours. Axial flare, um, you, what's gonna show there is once you do your DWI, you're gonna do your flare, which usually tends to be a little bit longer that's going to have white, bright plaques, you know, that suggests strokes or MS. So be on the lookout for that. Again, a very important case, a very important sequence, I should say. The next sequence is going to be that MPGR, that gradient. Okay, it's called it's a couple other things on other units, but this is to check for blood or hematoma in the head after trauma. So let's just say your patient comes in. You know, with a head injury, you're going to want to do your MPGR first, or your gradient first before your flares, okay? Um, for other, you know, sports-related injuries, concussions, very common in concussion protocols is the axial SWI, which is very similar to DWI. It checks um, restricted um, water in the brain, so uh, keep that in mind for any, you know, post-sport injury to the head um, injuries. Axial T2, it's very common. Axial T2 and Axial T1 are very common. Uh, you're going to get a nice visualization of the posterior brain, the stem, and the fossa. Uh, axial T1, you're going to view mainly for pre-contrast studies, okay? It's common in all routine brains. You have to do it, um, but usually it's more useful when you're doing post-contrast because you're going to follow that up with an Axial T1 post, an Axial T1, uh, a Sagittal T1 post to see any sort of... Um, reactions to things such as masses, lesions, infections in the brain. Coronal oblique T2, and we'll show that when we're going through our cases in just a moment, but uh, it usually looks right through the hippocampus. So it cuts that hippocampus in cross-section. It's, you know, lining up with the brainstem and basically um, in anterior tilt about 40, 30 to 45 degrees, depending on the angulation of that hippocampus. 
uh, temporal lobe. All right, so that kind of cleans up or touches on the MRI protocols and the setup. Let's jump into the images. After our three plane localizer, we then get our first image, which is that sagittal T1 I mentioned earlier. This shot right here is a slice right down the mid sagittal line of the brain. Okay, from here, this is where we'll plot our axials and our coronal views of the brain. So this being that central piece, we'll start here. Um, this is sort of that one slice, that, that money shot, so that you see a lot of anatomy and profile. So we'll just sort of start from the bottom left. The medulla oblongata here is just, uh, you know, part of that brain stem, just inferior to the pons. The sphenoid process is a sinus right below and where that pituitary gland sits within the cella turcica. The pons, as we mentioned, is part of that midbrain piece. The pituitary gland sits right within the cella turcica. The infundibulum is this little stalk that comes off the brain and kind of uh, bounces off into the pituitary gland. The corpus callosum, which is a very, uh, I can say, famous, uh, you know, landmark or anatomical structure for MR techs, because this is what we use to base off our entire axial planes. So corpus callosum is this cavernous area. Thalamus, it's just inferior to that. Sorry about that. The cerebrum is the large area of the brain. It's actually separated into certain lobes. We'll get into that in just a second. The quadrigeminal cistern is this cavernous area behind the quadrigeminal plate. The quadrigeminal plate connects with the cerebellum through the aqueduct of Silvis, which is this little piece right here. Again, this is a nice money shot. You get it all in profile. You may or may not see that, but uh, in this one you can. This is the tentorium, which basically is a separator between the occipital lobe and that cerebellum area. The fourth ventricle is this sort of triangular, um, you know, cavernous area as well. Cerebral tonsil is the inferior aspect of the cerebellum, which can extend in, in, in and through the cisterna magna, which, uh, you know, can cause Chiari malformation, which is that common, um, you know, MRI ruler that you'll see. So again, this is where you'll see that. And that will likely extend below this line from the clivus to the cisterna magna. If it kind of, if that cerebral tonsil extends below that, that's where you're kind of going to get that cherry malformation. And again, the radiologist will make that call, but it's good to be vigilant and to kind of keep your eyes peeled for that. As we scroll through, we can see some sinuses a little bit more. So frontal sinus, the ethmoid sinus, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. Okay, the frontal lobe, the cerebellum here, these are just sort of outside. Now we're sort of on the left side of the brain, but you know, you're still getting good views of that. So as you kind of scroll through, you'll see the temporal lobe, okay, the hippocampus. So we're gonna slot, you know, our coronal images are gonna go sort of this way. Here, I can draw a line if we'd like. So they would sort of run, a regular coronal would be this way. But in this case, like we said earlier, we'll do 30 to 45 degrees. So, and the slices will go this way. Then the slices will go this way. Okay, parietal lobe, temporal lobe. Okay, there you, get, you see your TMJ there as you go laterally. So there's your temporomandibular joint. There are certain cases for that, which we will discuss. Okay, that's sort of all the way out. As we go over, see the occipital lobe. Okay, you can see the cochlea on the sagittal view. You'll see that better on the axial view. Okay, the sylvian fissure, which is that piece right, be it's, it's a separator between the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. Okay, and then your, your EAM or your external ac acoustic meatus. Okay, moving on to the flare. This is that flare image I was telling you about. Um, again, that should be done immediately, you know, as either one of your one of three slices to start uh, sequences to start off of. So if anything comes back in terms of stroke, you'll see that as a big white piece or or, or dots within the brain. Um, depending on the severity of the stroke, it'll be a larger or smaller piece. Okay, scrolling through. This 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 scan uh, has a very high TR um, and a high TI, so it does take uh, quite a bit of time, but it is very very uh, informative. Here's a DWI, usually takes around 30 to, to a minute. Okay, if there's a stroke, you'll see it in the same spot. You'll see it as a, as, a, as a bright spot here. 
and you'll see it also on a bright spot on the flare. If it shows up on the DWI, it's likely a new stroke. Okay, on the flare, it'll stay there. So that's why you do both of these uh, together. The Axial T2, it shows, uh, it shows a lot of structures, so I decided to um, essentially mark my images on this sequence, the caudat nucleus, sort of these sections right here. Uh, it's very faint, but definitely easy to see on the uh, Axial T2. The internal capsule is a sort of capsula capsulated area here. Okay. Uh, the putamen here is just a little bit more lateral and a little bit more posterior. It's these little flares coming out. The thalamus here, dead center, and the superior sagittal sinus, or the SSS, is here on the back piece, which is where you would end up doing an MRV of the brain. Okay, your fourth ventricle here and your frontal sinus, your pons as we go lower. You'll see your right and your left cerebral artery here. Okay, on your MRA brain, you'll be looking directly for those. Um, and those, you know, you'll see through your source images nicely, your midbrain and your aqueductus sylvis on the axial view. Ethmoid sinus right here between the eyes. You can see the eyes and the optic nerves, the musculature in the eyes. Okay. And you can see how they attach right to the brain. Um, so again, that's why it's cranial nerve number two. Okay. As we get down, you have the vestibulocular nerve, which is your cranial nerve eight. Okay, you can see again, like little antennas, I like to say, uh, with the attachment right to the brain. Okay, maxillary sinuses, and there you go, a couple teeth. Okay, the coronal is not labeled, but just a kind of idea of what the coronal looks like. Um, kind of a scary picture as you kind of roll through to the anterior aspect, but kind of going posterior, you'll be able to see that optic nerve in cross section. Okay, kind of coming through. Um, your temporal lobes here, you know, and your cochlea.